For this lecture, we will be covering the topics on acellular microbes and prokaryotes. For acellular microbes, we'll be discussing viruses, viroids, and prions. And for the prokaryotes, we'll be discussing about bacteria and archaea. As you will recall, microbes can be divided into those that are truly cellular. This include the bacteria, the archaea, algae, the protozoa, and fungi and those that are acellular, or the viruses, viroids, and prions. The cellular microorganisms can be subdivided into those that are prokaryotic and eukaryotic. For the prokaryotic, these are the bacteria and archaea, and those that are eukaryotic, algae, protozoa, and fungi. Acellular microorganisms are not considered by most scientists to be living organisms. Thus, instead of being designated by the term microorganisms, Viruses, viroids, and prions are more correctly referred to as acellular microbes, or non-living microbes, or infectious particles. We'll first discuss the acellular microbes. These include viruses, viroids, and prions. Complete virus particles, called virions, are very small and simple in structure. Most viruses range in size from 10 to 300 nanometers in diameter, although some viruses are uh, way bigger, like the Ebola virus that can reach up to 1 micrometer in length. Scientists were unable to see viruses until electron microscopes were invented in the 30s. And no type of organism is safe from viral infections, so viruses infect humans, animals, plants, fungi, protozoa, algae, and bacterial cells. Some viruses, called oncogenic viruses or oncoviruses, cause specific types of cancer, including human cancers such as lymphomas, carcinomas, and some types of leukemia. A typical virion consists of a genome of either DNA or RNA surrounded by a capsid or the protein coat which is composed of many small protein units called capsomeres. Together, the nucleic acid and the capsid are referred to as the nucleocapsid. Some viruses, called envelope viruses, have an outer envelope composed of lipids and polysaccharides. Aside from protecting the DNA or RNA inside it, it plays a role in viral infection, in viral attachment, it helps in entering cells and release of capsid contents into the host cell. These are examples of viral nucleocapsids. In letter A, you'll see a nucleocapsid of a helical virus because it looks spiral. In letter B, you'll see a nucleocapsid of an icosahedral virus because it is, as its name implies, it looks like a polyhedron with 20 phases. The viral nucleocapsids are named based on their structural appearance, and they serve as a protein shell of the virus to protect the genome from harsh environment. This is an example of enveloped viruses. So in letter A, or the first picture on the left, you'll see an enveloped helical virus. And the other one on the right is an enveloped icosahedral virus because of its structure. Viruses are said to have five specific properties that distinguish them from living cells. Take note of these five properties. First, the vast majority of viruses possess either DNA or RNA, unlike living cells which possess both. Second, they are unable to replicate or multiply on their own. So their replication is directed by the viral nucleic acid once it has been introduced into the host cell. Third, Unlike cells, they do not divide by binary fission, not by mitosis, or not by meiosis. Fourth, they lack the genes and enzymes necessary for energy production. And fifth, they depend on the ribosomes, enzymes, and metabolites of the host cell for protein and nucleic acid production. Viruses are classified by the following characteristics. First, the type of genetic material they possess, either DNA or RNA. Remember that DNA is always a single molecule, while the RNA can exist either as a single molecule or in several pieces. 
whether the virus nucleic acid is single-stranded or double-stranded. Third, whether the virus nucleic acid is positive sense or negative sense. This plays an important role on how a certain virus will code for new genes and replicate. For example, a positive sense single-stranded RNA can be translated directly to form proteins using host ribosome. On the other hand, in a negative sense single-stranded RNA, a negative strand must be transcribed first into positive strand before a viral genome codes for a new viral protein. So this is important on how a virus will code for new genes. Next, the shape of the capsid. They may be polyhedral or many sides. They can be helical or cold tubes, bullet-shaped, spherical, or a complex combination of these shapes. Next, the number of capsomeres. The size of the virus is determined by the size of each facet and the number of capsomeres in each. Another characteristic is the size of capsids. Next, the presence or absence of an envelope. This makes the virus appear spherical or irregular in shape. Envelopes are very important in studying viruses medically because they give scientists a clue as to how we can somehow predict the next susceptible host cell to be invaded by the virus. Although it is really hard to accurately predict a virus behavior because they mutate intelligently, the viral envelope will give us somehow a clue as to what is the next susceptible host that the virus will invade. Diba, viruses mutate by copying the host cell's nuclear membrane or cell membrane to form the viral envelope so that they can copy a host cell's genome without being detected. Then, they alter this membrane for it to survive. They add proteins to it, then that will enable the virus to recognize the next host cell to be invaded. The next classification uh, of viruses is based on the type of host that it infects, the type of disease it produces, the target cells, and the immunologic or antigenic properties. There are four categories of viruses based on the type of nucleic acid that they possess, and most viral genomes are of the first two types. So the most common are double-stranded DNA viruses and double-stranded RNA viruses. But there are also viruses that are single-stranded DNA and single-stranded RNA viruses. So again, a genome is an organism's complete set of genetic information. The most viral genomes are circular molecules but some are linear. Take note of this slide because this is important to us who are in the healthcare field. These are some of the viruses that infect humans. Note that some viruses contain RNA, whereas others contain DNA, and that the nucleic acid that they possess may either be single or double-stranded. A quick review from your biology and biochemistry. So within the host cell, the single-stranded positive sense RNA functions as messenger RNA or mRNA. Whereas, the single-stranded negative sense RNA serves as template for the production of mRNA. So, some of the viruses uh, possess an envelope, whereas others do not. Some notable examples of RNA viruses are classified into non-enveloped and enveloped. Under the non-enveloped double-stranded, we have the rotavirus, this caused the cough, colds, and diarrhea among infants and toddlers. Among the enveloped RNA viruses, uh, notable are the positive sense single-stranded coronaviruses. This caused the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome or MERS-CoV, also the SARS-CoV, and now the SARS-CoV-2 or the COVID-19. Another important enveloped single-stranded negative sense and linear RNA viruses are rhabdoviruses, this causes the rabies, and paramyxoviruses, this include the paramyxovirus that cause mumps, and morbillivirus that cause measles. Another enveloped RNA virus are retroviruses that cause AIDS and some leukemia. 
On the other hand, DNA viruses are also classified as non-enveloped or enveloped. Non-enveloped single-stranded linear DNA viruses include parvoviruses. This uh, cause the fifth disease caused by the parvovirus 19 in humans. Also, parvovirus uh, cause fatal, uh, fatal disease to dogs. Another non-enveloped but double-stranded linear DNA virus include adenoviruses. These cause the cold-like symptoms, the fever, conjunctivitis, and bronchitis on all ages. Under the non-enveloped double-stranded circular DNA viruses is the papilloma viruses that cause warts and cervical cancer. Now on the envelope double-stranded linear DNA viruses include the herpes viruses in, uh, including the herpes simplex that cause the sexually transmitted disease oral and genital herpes and the varicella zoster virus that cause chicken pox and shingles. Another example uh, is the pox viruses. This cause the already eradicated smallpox and molluscum contagiosum. Note that chicken pox does not belong to the pox viruses. Instead, they are uh, under the herpes viruses because they are caused by the varicella zoster virus. And lastly, one important envelope double-stranded circular DNA viruses are hepadenoviruses. This causes hepatitis. One important concept that we need to discuss is how a virus penetrates a host cell. For a non-envelope virus, the first step in the multiplication of animal viruses is attachment, or what we call the adsorption of the virus to the cell. Like bacteriophages, animal virus can attach only to cells bearing the appropriate protein or polysaccharide receptors on their surface. Did you ever wonder why certain viruses cause infections in animals but not in humans or vice versa? Or ever wonder why certain viruses cause respiratory infections but not gastrointestinal infections? It all boils down to receptors. Viruses can only attach to and invade cells that bear a receptor that they can recognize. The second step in the multiplication of animal viruses is penetration where the entire virion usually enters the host cell, sometimes because the cell phagocytizes the virus. You can see in the second step the invagination of the membrane. From this point on, the viral nucleic acid dictates what occurs within the host cell. The fourth step is biosynthesis, whereby many uh, viral pieces are produced. The virus will now produce complete virions, release it to the host cell to produce an overwhelming infection. On the other hand, an enveloped virus enters a host cell by binding of the virus to a host cell membrane receptor. The second step is penetration of virus through fusion of viral envelope with the host cell membrane. Then on the third step, uncoating happens and the nucleocapsid enters the cell. The viral nucleic acid escapes from the capsid. And after this, just like a non-enveloped virus, it will proceed with the last three steps in the multiplication of animal viruses. By the way, whenever you encounter an enveloped virus, you know that it has escaped from its host cell by budding. This is an electron micrograph of herpes viruses acquiring their envelopes as they leave a host cell's nucleus by budding. The numbers 1, 2, 3 are the viruses within the nucleus. Number 4 is a virus in the process of leaving the nucleus by budding. And numbers 5 and 6 are viruses that have already acquired their envelopes. This shows the comparative sizes of virions, their nucleic acids, and bacteria. Again, these are the six steps in the multiplication of animal viruses. First, the attachment of the virus to the host cell. Second, penetration of the entire virion to the host cell. Third, uncoating where viral nucleic acid escapes from the capsid. Fourth, biosynthesis where many viral pieces are produced. These are the nucleic acid and viral proteins. Fifth is the assembly 
that involves fitting the various pieces together to produce complete virions, and sixth, release or the escape of the new virus out of the whole cell. Again, animal viruses escape from their host cell either by lysis of the cell or by budding. Viruses that escape by budding become enveloped viruses. Although most viruses produce symptoms as soon as they overwhelm the immune system of the host, there are also latent virus infections. These are viral infections in which the virus is able to hide from host immune system by entering cells and remaining dormant or inactive. Good example of this are herpes and varicella um, viruses. So, for example, once you've had chickenpox, whenever your body has a low immune system, you can uh, acquire the infection again as a recurrent infection, but in a different form, in a, in the form of shingles. So they never completely go away. Uh, and this can manifest even years later after the first infection. It is important to remember that antibiotics are not effective against viral infections. We don't go giving antibiotics for chickenpox or measles. We don't give antibiotics to treat HIV. Instead, we give antiviral agents. These agents interfere with virus-specific enzymes and virus production by disrupting critical phases in viral multiplication or inhibiting synthesis of viral DNA, RNA, or proteins. Viruses that cause cancer are called oncogenic viruses or oncoviruses. One example is the Epstein-Barr virus. This is a type of herpes virus that causes infectious mononucleosis, although this is not a type of cancer. But uh, Epstein-Barr virus is very notorious at producing it. And another three types of human cancers, the nasopharyngeal carcinoma, Burkitt lymphoma, and B-cell lymphoma. A type of cancer common in its patient, called the Kaposi sarcoma, is caused by human herpes virus 8 and associations between hepatitis B and C viruses and hepatocellular carcinoma have been established. Human papillomaviruses or HPV cause the warts and can cause different types of cancer. This include the cancers of the cervix and other parts of the genital tract. A retrovirus that is closely related to human immune deficiency virus or the HIV is the causative agent of AIDS. This is called the human T lymphotrophic um, virus type 1. This causes a rare type of adult T cell leukemia. Another virus of interest to the medical field is the human immune deficiency virus. HIV is an enveloped single stranded RNA virus that belongs to the family of viruses called retroviridae. Take note that retroviruses are characterized by long incubation period from the onset of initial infection to the presentation of disease symptoms. So if you are infected with HIV, it will not manifest as soon as you acquire it. It will take time. The primary targets of HIV are CD4 cells and those that are having CD4 receptors on their surface. This picture shows that HIV is an envelope virus containing two identical single-stranded RNA molecules. Note that each of its 72 surface knobs contain a glycoprotein, designated as GP120. This is capable of binding to a CD4 receptor on the surface of certain host cells. The stock that supports the knob is a transmembrane glycoprotein, which was also or may also play a role in attachment to host cells. We were discussing earlier that viruses can infect anything. With that said, like animal cells, bacteria can also be infected by viruses called bacteriophages or simply phages. Like all viruses, they are obligate intracellular pathogens in that they must enter a cell to replicate. They cannot survive alone without its host cell. There are two categories of bacteriophages, virulent bacteriophages and temperate bacteriophages. Virulent bacteriophages always cause what is known as the lytic cycle, 
which ends with the destruction or lysis of the bacterial cell. For most phages, the whole process from attachment to lysis takes less than an hour. On the other hand, temperate phages, also known as lysogenic phages, do not immediately initiate the lytic cycle, but rather, their DNA remains integrated into the bacterial cell chromosome generation after generation. This is the structure of a bacteriophage. In letter A, you can see that the bacteriophage T4 is an assembly of protein components. The head is a protein membrane with 20 facets filled with DNA. It is attached to a tail consisting of a hollow core surrounded by a sheet and based on a spike end plate to which six fibers are attached. In letter B, you can see that following attachment to host cell, the sheet contracts driving the core through the cell wall and viral DNA enters the cell. In the first picture, in letter A, you can see the partially lysed cell of a Vibrio cholerae bacterium with many attached variants of fudge. In letter B, there are numerous bacteriophages attached to a bacterial cell. This is the summary of the lytic process. The replicative cycle of the bacteriophage is very similar to that of animal viruses, except uh, that bacteriophages do not actually enter the host cell, but rather inject their nucleic acid into the cell. The first step in the lytic cycle is attachment of the phage to the surface of the bacterial cell. This is also known as the adsorption. Take note that the phage can only attach to bacterial cells that possess the appropriate receptor, it's either a protein or a polysaccharide, a molecule on the surface of the cell, that they can recognize, or the molecules that are also on the surface of the fudge. It is like a lock and key concept, where the receptors on the surface of bacterial cells should fit on the receptors on the surface of the fudge. Most bacteriophages are species and strain specific, meaning that they only infect a particular species or strain of bacteria. Those that infect Escherichia coli are called coliphages. The second step in the lytic cycle is called the penetration. In this step, the fudge injects its DNA into the bacterial cell and acting much like a needle. From this point on, the fudge DNA dictates what occurs within the bacterial cell. This is sometimes described as the fudge DNA taking over the whole cell's machinery. The third step in the lytic cycle is called biosynthesis. It is during this step that the fudge genes are expressed, resulting in the production of viral pieces. Uh, it is also during this step that the whole cell's enzyme, for example, DNA or RNA polymerase, the nucleotides, amino acids, and ribosomes are used to make the viral DNA and viral proteins. In the fourth step of the lytic cycle, called assembly, the viral pieces are assembled to produce complete viral particles or virions. It is during this step that viral DNA is packed up into capsids. And finally, the fifth step, step in the lytic cycle, called the release, is when the whole cell burst open and all of the new virions escape from the cell. Thus, the lytic cycle ends with lysis of the whole cell. The lysis is caused by an enzyme also uh, referred to as endolysine that is coded for by a fudge gene. At the appropriate time, after the assembly, the appropriate viral gene is exp expressed, then the enzyme is produced and the bacterial cell wall is destroyed. Now we'll move on to viroids and prions. These are smaller and less complex infectious particles than viruses. Although viruses are extremely small non-living infectious agents, viroids and prions are even smaller and less, less complex infectious agents. Viroids consist of short, naked fragments of single-stranded RNA that can interfere with the metabolism of uh, plant cells and they can stunt the growth of plants and sometimes they kill the plants in the process. They are transmitted between plants in the manner like viruses. Plant diseases thought or known to be caused by viruses include potato spindle tuber 
or producing small cracked spindle-shaped potatoes, stunting of citrus trees, and diseases of coconut palms and potatoes. But so far, no animal diseases have been discovered that are caused by viroids. Prions are small infectious proteins that cause fatal neurologic diseases in animals and humans in which the brain becomes riddled with holes, so they become sponge-like. Prions are thought to be transmitted by consumption of food contaminated with the agent. The human prion diseases of Kuru, the creutzfeldt jakob disease, and gerstmann strausler schenker syndrome involve loss of coordination in dementia. As we all know, dementia is a general mental, mental deterioration. This is characterized by disorientation, impaired memory, impaired judgment, and intellect. As we can recall, in 2011, there is an outbreak of mad cow disease worldwide. So scientists investigated the link between the mad cow disease and a form of creutzfeldt jakob disease. These cases probably resulted from the humans eating the prion-infected beef, uh, and the cattle or the beef that the humans uh, have consumed may probably acquire the disease through ingestion of cattle feed that contain uh, ground-up parts of prion-infected sheep. Of all the infectious agents, prions are believed to be the most resistant to destruction. They retain their infectivity after treatment with disinfectants and heat. And the mechanism in which prions cause disease remains a mystery. Although it is known that prions convert normal protein molecules into non-functional ones, causing the normal molecules to change their shape. It is believed that the unfolding of the protein causes cell damage uh, with the resulting sponge-like appearance of brain tissue. All these diseases are untreatable and fatal and are collectively referred to as transmissible spongiform encephalopathies. We have said that prions are very resistant organisms. The only way to inactivate prions are, is by subjecting them to prolonged exposure to sodium hydroxide, or also known as lye, or caustic soda that we use to unplug our sink at home. And that is something, of course, that we cannot do once the prion is already inside the body. Now we'll move on to bacteria. This is the biggest bulk of our discussion on prokaryotic cells. According to Burgess Manual, the domain bacteria contains organisms that are broadly divided into three phenotypic categories. These are the categories based on their physical characteristics. First, those that are gram-negative and have a cell wall. Second, those that are gram-positive and have a cell wall. And third, those that lack a cell wall. Many characteristics of bacteria are examined to provide data for identification and classification. These characteristics include cell shape, morphologic arrangement, staining reactions, motility, colony morphology, atmospheric and nutritional requirements, biochemical and metabolic activities, specific enzymes that organism produces, the pathogenicity or the ability to cause disease, and genetic composition. There are three basic shapes of bacteria. These are the cocci or the round bacteria, the bacilli or the rod-shaped bacteria, and the curved and spiral-shaped bacteria, sometimes referred to as spirilia. Cocci may be seen singly or in pairs, chains, clusters, packets of four or packets of eight. This is depending on the particular species and the manner in which the cells divide. The average cocos is about 1 micrometer in diameter. Note that some cocci have cocos in their name. Some examples of medically important cocci include Enterococcus species, the Neisseria species, Staphylococcus species, and Streptococcus species. Again, these are the categories of bacteria based on the shape of their cells. You can see the round-shaped cocci, the curved and spiral-shaped bacteria, and the rod-shaped bacilli. Here are the morphologic arrangements of cocci and their sample diseases. When you see cocci in pairs, these are diplococci. 
One example is Neisseria gonorrhea, which cause gonorrhea. When you see cocci in chains, these are streptococci. One example is the Streptococcus pyogenes, which causes strep throat. When you see cocci in clusters, these are staphylococci. Example of this is Staphylococcus aureus. This causes boils or pigsa. When you see a packet of four cocci, this is called tetrad. One example is Micrococcus luteus. This is rarely pathogenic. On the other hand, if you see a packet of 8 cocci, this is called octad. Example of this is Sarcina ventriculi. Uh, this is a rare cause of disease. In the first picture in letter A, you can see a photomicrograph of gram-stained Staphylococcus aureus cells illustrating gram-positive or the blue cocci in grape-like clusters. It doesn't really appear blue here in the picture, but when you see it in a real microscope, it usually appears blue or purple. Also on the first picture, you can see a pink, a pink stained material that is a white blood cell. On the second picture, that's letter B, that is a scanning electron micrograph of streptococcus mutans illustrating cocci in chains. This causes dental caries. Bacilli, often referred to as rods, may be short or long, thick or thin, and pointed or with curved or blunt ends. They may occur singly, in pairs or diplobacilli, in chains or streptobacilli, in long filaments or branched. An average size bacillus is around 1 by 3 micrometers. Some rods are quite short, resembling elongated cocci. They are called cocobacilli. So examples are Listeria monocytogenes and Haemophilus influenzae. Examples of medically important bacilli include members of the family Enterobacteriaceae. Examples are Enterobacter, the Escherichia, Klebsiella, Proteus, Salmonella, and Shigella species. Another medically important bacilli are Pseudomonas originosa. Bacillus species and Clostridium species. Curved and spiral shaped bacilli are placed into a third morphologic grouping. Curved bacteria usually occur singly, but some species may form pairs. A pair of curved bacilli resembles a bird and is described as having a gull wing morphology. Examples are Vibrio species such as Vibrio cholerae, the causative agent of cholera and Vibrio parahemolyticus, a causative agent of diarrhea. They are curved, comma-shaped bacilli. Another example is the Campylobacter species. It is a common cause of diarrhea as well, have a gull wing morphology. On the other hand, spiral-shaped bacteria are referred to as spirochetes. Different species of spirochetes vary in size, length, rigidity, and the number and amplitude of their coils. Some, such as Treponema pallidum, the cause of syphilis, are tightly coiled with a flexible cell wall that enables them to move readily through tissues. Another example of a spirochete is the Borella species, the causative agent of Lyme disease and relapsing fever, are examples of less tightly coiled spirochetes. This is an example of a curved Campylobacter species stained by 1% carbol fuchsin. Look how it resembles a gull wing. This is a scanning electron micrograph of Treponema pallidum, the spiral-shaped bacterium that causes syphilis. Another example of a spiral-shaped bacteria is the Borella hermsi. This is a stained blood smear. In those where the arrow points, those are the Borella. This is the cause of the relapsing fever. Most bacteria are colorless, transparent, and difficult to see. Therefore, various staining methods have been devised to enable scientists to examine bacteria. In preparation for staining, the bacteria are smeared onto a glass microscope slide, resulting in what is known as a smear, air dried, and then fixed. In general, fixation serves three purposes. First, it kills the organisms. 
Second, it preserves their morphology or shape. And third, it anchors the smear to the slide. Fixation is an important procedure that we do so that we can examine the microorganisms under the microscope. But more importantly, it is part of the safety measure that we do to assure that we will not be infected by the organisms that we are examining. The two most common methods of fixation are heat fixation and methanol fixation. Heat fixation is usually accomplished by placing the slide on a slide warmer. If not performed properly, excess heat can distort the morphology of the cells. So this is not a standardized technique. On the other hand, the methanol fixation is a standardized technique and the preferred method of fixation. We accomplish this by flooding the smear with absolute methanol for 30 seconds. Uh, this is more satisfactory fixation technique and better preserves the morphology of cells and microorganisms. Specific stains and staining techniques are used to observe bacterial cell morphology, such as the size, the shape, the morphologic arrangement, composition of cell walls, if they have capsules, flagella, endospores, etc. These are the three major categories of staining procedures. First is the simple stain. It is sufficient to determine bacterial shape and morphologic arrangement, for example, if they are in pairs, in chains, or clusters. On the other hand, structural staining procedures are used to observe bacterial capsules, spores, and flagella. And lastly, the differential staining procedures. Gram staining is uh, one of the most important staining procedures in the bacteriology laboratory because it differentiates between gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. The organism's gram reaction serves as an extremely important clue when attempting to learn the identity or the species of a particular bacterium. But it is important to take note that some bacteria, such as the mycobacterium species, that cause leprosy and tuberculosis do not stain well, if at all, with a gram stain because of the high lipid content in their cell walls. They are more often identified using a staining procedure called the acid fast stain. These are the steps in simple bacterial staining technique. First, with the flame loop, smear a loop full of bacteria suspended in broth or water into a slide. Then allow to air dry. Once dried, fix the smear with absolute or 100% methanol. Then flood the slide with the stain. And rinse with water and blot dry with paper towel. Once the bacteria is fixed, examine the slide with the 100 times magnification microscope objective and use a drop of immersion oil directly on the smear. Another important staining procedure is the gram staining. Gram staining divides bacteria into two major groups, the gram-positive and the gram-negative. Gram-positive bacteria end up being blue to purple, while the gram-negative bacteria end up being pink to red. The color of the bacteria at the end of the gram staining procedure depends on the chemical composition of their cell wall. If the bacteria were not decolorized during the decolorization step, they will be blue to purple, and such bacteria are said to be gram-positive. The thick layer of peptidoglycan in the cell walls of gram-positive bacteria makes it difficult to remove the crystal violet iodine complex during the decolorization step. On the other hand, the thin layer of peptidoglycan in the cell walls of gram-negative bacteria makes it easier to remove the crystal violet iodine complex during decolorization. The cells were subsequently stained by the saffronin or a red dye. So in summary, this is the difference between a gram-positive bacteria and a gram-negative bacteria. At the end of the gram staining, the gram-positive will be blue to purple, the gram-negative are pink to red. When it comes to peptidoglycan cell walls, the gram-positive bacteria have a thick layer while the gram-negative bacteria have a thin layer. 
Note that gram-positive bacteria have tachoic acid and lipotachoic acid in their cell walls, while the gram-negative bacteria is the one that has the lipopolysaccharide in their cell walls. So lipopolysaccharide meaning lipo or fats and polysaccharide meaning many saccharide is sugar, so many sugar and lipid is the content of the cell wall of the gram-negative bacteria. These are the gram staining technique. So after fixing the specimen to a slide, we first flood the slide with crystal violet solution and we allow it to act for one minute. Then we rinse the slide, then flood it with iodine solution and allow it to act for one minute. Then we rinse off the excess iodine. We decolorize it with ethanol approximately five seconds. Then we wash the slide immediately with water and after ethanol decolorization, those organisms that are gram-negative are no longer visible. We then apply saffronin counter stain for 30 seconds. Then we wash it in water and blot and dry in air. Then we examine it under the microscope. These are some examples of various gram-positive bacteria. On the first picture are chains of gram-positive streptococci in a gram-stained smear from a broth culture. The second picture is a gram-positive streptococcus pneumoniae in a gram-stained smear of a blood culture. On the first picture are gram-positive bacilli, the Clostridium perfringens, in a gram-stained smear prepared from a broth culture. Individual bacilli and chains of bacilli or streptobacilli can be seen. On the second picture are gram-positive bacilli, the Clostridium tetany, in a gram-stained smear from a broth culture. Look at the arrows. They are the terminal spores that can be seen on some of the cells. These are the many gram-positive bacteria that can be seen on the surface of a pink-stained epithelial cell in this gram-stained sputum specimen. Several smaller uh, pink-staining polymorphonuclear leukocytes can be seen also in this picture. Now these are the examples of gram-negative bacteria. The first picture is a gram-negative bacilli in a gram-stained smear prepared from a bacterial colony. Note that individual bacilli and a few short chains of bacilli can be seen. On the second picture, these are loosely coiled gram-negative spirochetes. These are Borella burgdorferi. Uh, this is the etiologic agent of Lyme disease. Some bacteria are neither consistently purple nor pink after gram staining. They are known as the gram-variable bacteria. The example of this is Mycobacterium species, and for this, we use the acid fast stain. In the Kenyan procedure, we use the carbol fuchsin, a bright red dye, and uh, we first use it to stain the cells. The phenol component of the stain or the carbol acts to lock the stain into the cell wall. A decolorizing agent or a mixture of acid and alcohol is then used in an attempt to remove the red color from the cells. And because mycobacteria are not decolorized by the acid-alcohol mixture, again, owing to the waxes in their cell walls, they are said to be acid-fast. In this picture, many red acid-fast bacilli, the mycobacterium tuberculosis, can be seen in this acid-fast stained concentrate from a digested sputum specimen. If a bacterium is able to swim, it is said to be motile. Bacteria unable to swim are said to be non-motile. Bacterial motility is most often associated with the presence of flagella or axial filaments, although some bacteria exhibit a type of gliding motility on secreted slime. Take note again that bacteria never possess cilia. Most spiral-shaped bacteria in about one half of the bacilli are motile by means of flagella, but cocci are generally non-motile. A flagella stain can be used to demonstrate the presence, the number, and the location of flagella on bacterial cells 
but motility can be demonstrated by stabbing the bacteria into a tube of semi-solid agar or by using the hanging drop technique. In this picture shows a semi-solid agar method for determining motility. In letter A, you will see an uninoculated tube of semi-solid agar. On letter B, the same tube being inoculated by stabbing the inoculating wire into the medium. In letter C, the pattern of growth of a non motile organism after incubation. And you can see on letter B, the pattern of growth of a motile organism after incubation. This is a hanging drop preparation for the study of living bacteria. You can see a drop of liquid culture medium hangs from the center of a cover glass. Uh, this is above the depression in a glass depression slide. You will also see a ring of petroleum jelly around the edge of the depression. This prevents the drop from touching the slide. A single bacterial cell that lands on the surface of a solid culture medium cannot be seen, but after it divides over and over again, it produces a pile of bacteria known as the bacterial colony. A colony contains millions of organisms. The colony morphology or the appearance of the colonies of bacteria varies from one species to another. Colony morphology includes the size, color, the overall shape, elevation, and the appearance of the edge of or margin of the colony. Colony morphology also includes the results of enzymatic activity on various types of culture media. As it is true for cell morphology and staining characteristics, colony features serves as an important clue in the identification of bacteria. The size of colonies is determined by the organism's rate of growth or the generation time and is an important characteristic of a particular bacterial species. Illustrated on your right is the formation of bacterial colony on solid growth medium in which the generation time is assumed to be 30 minutes. Take note that this is just an example of a bacteria that has a generation time of 30 minutes. This just shows us the concept of generation time. As seen in the picture, from a single bacterial cell, in 30 minutes, it will become two. After another 30 minutes, or its first hour, they will double again and becomes four. After another 30 minutes, that will double to eight, and so on. We multiply the number of cells by two every 30 minutes. So in four hours, they will become 256 bacterial cells. In eight hours, there will be 65,000 bacterial cells. And in 12 hours or half a day, you will see 17 million bacterial cells and would probably be numerous enough to be seen by the naked eye. Again, different bacterial species will have different generation time and will have a variation depending on its environment and nutrition. In the microbiology laboratory, it is useful to classify bacteria on the basis of their relationship to oxygen and carbon dioxide. With respect to oxygen, a bacterial isolate can be classified into one of five major groups. Obligate aerobes, microaerophilic aerobes or microaerophiles, facultative anaerobes, air-tolerant anaerobes, and obligate anaerobes. Obligate aerobes and microaerophiles require oxygen, while obligate anaerobes, aerotolerant anaerobes, and facultative anaerobes can thrive in an atmosphere devoid of oxygen. Some bacteria, referred to as capnophiles or capnophilic organisms, grow better in the laboratory in the presence of increased concentration of uh, carbon dioxide. Note that room air contains uh, only less than 1% of carbon dioxide. So, capnophiles will grow only in the clinical microbiology lab with carbon dioxide incubators that are calibrated to contain between 5% and 10% carbon dioxide. In a liquid medium such as the thioglycolate broth or thio in short, the region of the medium in which the organism grows depends on the oxygen needs of that particular species. We will now be zooming in to the classifications of bacterial isolates based on the oxygen requirement. 
To grow and multiply, obligate aerobes require an atmosphere containing molecular oxygen in concentrations comparable to that found in room air. That is 20 to 21 percent oxygen. Mycobacteria and certain fungi are examples of microorganisms that are obligate aerobes. That is why when we see an x-ray film of a patient infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis, we will find the opacities or white area where the mycobacterium culture is on the upper part of the lungs because that is the most aerated part of the lungs. On the other hand, microaerophiles or microaerophilic microbes also require oxygen for multiplication but in concentrations lower than uh, that found in room air. So examples are Neisseria gonorrhea, the causative agent of gonorrhea, and Campylobacter species, which are the major causes of bacterial diarrhea. They prefer an atmosphere containing about 5% oxygen. The following three classifications are collectively called anaerobes. So anaerobes can be defined as organisms that do not require oxygen for life and reproduction. However, they vary in their sensitivity to oxygen. The terms obligate anaerobe, aerotolerant anaerobe, and facultative anaerobe are used to describe the organism's relationship to molecular oxygen. Facultative anaerobes are capable of surviving in either the presence or the absence of oxygen, anywhere from zero oxygen to room air, of around 20 to 21 percent oxygen. Many of the bacteria routinely uh, isolated from the clinical specimens are facultative anaerobes. For example, are the members of the family Enterobacteriaceae, most streptococci, and most staphylococci. An aerotolerant anaerobe does not require oxygen, it grows better in the absence of oxygen, but can survive in an atmosphere containing molecular oxygen such as air and carbon dioxide incubator. The concentration of oxygen that an aerotolerant anaerobe can tolerate varies from one species to another. Examples are a few species of Clostridia, Lactobacillus plantarum, and most species of Lactobacillus in the vaginal flora. And lastly, an obligate anaerobe uh, is an anaerobe that can only grow in environment containing no oxygen. Some medically important obligate anaerobes are Gardnerella vaginalis. This is isolated from the normal female genitourinary tract and is also associated with vaginosis, resulting to fishy odor vaginal discharge. Another example is the Clostridium tetani, which causes tetanus, and some species of Clostridia, Lactobacillus, Actinomyces, and Propanibacterium species. These are the categories of bacteria based on their relationship to oxygen. The ones that are on extreme left, the obligate anaerobes, will die in the presence of oxygen, while the obligate aerobes on the extreme right are those that cannot live without oxygen. The ones that are in the middle, such as the facultative anaerobes, the aerotolerant anaerobes, and the microaerophiles, are the bacteria that can survive with or without oxygen. This is an illustration of how culturing microorganisms in thioglycolate broth, or thio, looks like. Thio contains a concentration gradient of dissolved oxygen ranging from 20 to 21% oxygen at the top of the tube, to 0% oxygen at the bottom of the tube. A bacterium will grow only in the part of the thio containing the concentration of oxygen that it requires. All bacteria need some form of the elements carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, sulfur, phosphorus, and nitrogen for growth. And some bacteria require special elements such as calcium, iron, zinc, manganese, and a lot more. Certain microbes have specific vitamin requirements and some need organic substances secreted by other living organisms during their growth. Organisms with special demanding nutritional requirements are said to be fastidious. Even enriched media must be used to grow fastidious organisms in the laboratory. 
The nutritional needs of a particular organism are usually characteristic of that species of bacteria and sometimes serve as important clues when attempting to identify the organism. As bacteria grow, they produce many waste products and secretions, some of which are enzymes that enable them to invade their host and cause disease. The pathogenic strains of many bacteria such as staphylococci and streptococci can be tentatively identified by the enzymes they secrete. Also, in particular environments, some bacteria are characterized by the production of certain gases such as carbon dioxide, hydrogen sulfide, oxygen, and methane. To help in the identification of certain types of bacteria in the laboratory, they are inoculated into various substrates to determine whether they possess the enzymes necessary to break down those substrates. Learning whether a particular organism is able to break down a certain substrate serves as a clue to the identity of that organism. Different types of culture media are also used in the laboratory to learn information about an organism's metabolic activities. Many pathogens are able to cause disease because they possess capsules, fimbriae, or endotoxins like biochemical components of the cell wall of gram-negative bacteria, or because they secrete exotoxins and exoenzymes that damage the cells and tissues. Frequently, pathogenicity or the ability to cause disease is tested by injecting the organism into mice or cell structures. Here is a summary of some of the most important pathogenic bacteria. Note their staining reaction, either they are gram-positive, are they gram-negative, or are they acid-fast. When reviewing the bacteria, you should also note what are the special features for, for particular bacteria. For example, we've been talking uh, before about the Staphylococcus aureus being described as cocci in clusters or in grape-like clusters. So you know that uh, when you see this kind of description, it is pertaining to Staphylococcus aureus. And by the way, it is a common uh, causative agent of food infections. Also note the uh, common diseases that are caused by specific um, bacteria. So, for example, strep, strep throat is, um, is caused by Streptococcus pyogenes. Pneumonia is a common uh, cause by Streptococcus pneumoniae. Those diseases that are covered by the vaccine, like diphtheria, this is caused by the uh, Corninibacterium diphtheriae. Those that are uh, hard to treat, although gram-positive, but are spore-forming, like the Bacillus anthracis that cause the anthrax, the Clostridium botulinum that cause botulism, and Clostridium perfringens that cause the very hard to treat wound infection, the gas gangrene. Also among the gram-positive are the branching, nocardia, and the very notable Clostridium tetani that causes tetanus and doesn't have a treatment. Again, for the gram negative naman, uh, you note the, the common diseases like uh, gonorrhea is caused by Neisseria gonorrhea. Uh, take note that those are who are the gram negative bacteria that cause the specific disease. For example, uh, the whooping cough or pertussis is caused by bordetella pertussis. The sexually transmitted infections like, uh, like the genital infections caused by chlamydia trachomatis. Some urinary tract infections, very common causes E. coli. Some other causes of urinary tract infection that... Uh, that can be uh, caused by Klebsiella pneumoniae or Proteus vulgaris. That's why uh, when we are suspecting that the patient is having a urinary tract infection that is complicated, we, um, we request for urine culture so that we'll know what kind of uh, infection we are dealing with and so that 
when we give uh, antibiotics, they are targeted to that particular infectious agent that is uh, present either in blood or either in urine. Take note of the some of the gram-negative bacteria that cause uh, gastroenteritis like salmonella, uh, the cause of typhoid fever, gastroenteritis uh, that caused by shigella, Vibrio cholerae that cause cholera, Treponema pallidum that cause syphilis. And of course, take note of the acid fast uh, bacteria. Dalawa lang naman yan. Mycobacterium leprae and uh, Mycobacterium tuberculosis. Most modern laboratories are moving toward the identification of bacteria using some type of test procedures that analyzes the organism's DNA or RNA. These test procedures are collectively referred to as molecular diagnostic procedures. The composition of the genetic material or the DNA of an organism is unique to each species. So DNA probes make it possible to identify and isolate without relying on phenotypic characteristics. And through the use of 16S rRNA sequencing, a researcher can determine the degree of relatedness between two different bacteria. Rickettsias, chlamydias, and mycoplasmas are bacteria, but they do not possess all the attributes of typical bacterial cells. That's why they are often referred to as unique or rudimentary bacteria. Because they are so small and difficult to isolate, they were formerly thought to be viruses. Rickettsias and chlamydias are bacteria with gram-negative type cell wall. They are obligate intracellular pathogens that cause disease in humans and other animals. As we all know, an obligate intracellular pathogen is a pathogen that must live within a host cell. Being that said, to grow such organisms in the laboratory, they must be inoculated into embryonated uh, chicken eggs or laboratory animals or cell cultures. And it is very hard to culture them because they do not grow on artificial culture media. Because rickettsias appear to have leaky cell membranes, most of them must live inside another cell to retain all the necessary cellular substances. And note that all diseases caused by rickettsia species are arthropod-borne, meaning that they are transmitted by arthropod vectors or carriers such as lice, fleas, and ticks from one host to another by their bites or waste products. Diseases caused by rickettsia species include typhus and typhus-like uh, diseases. These are uh, example of this is spotted fever rickettsiosis. All these diseases involve the production of a rash. And take note that these organisms have no connection to disease called rickets which is the result of vitamin D deficiency. That is a completely different kind of disease. On the other hand, the term chlamydias which also refers to chlamydia species and closely related organisms uh, are referred to as energy parasites. Although they can produce adenosine triphosphate molecules or ATPs, they preferentially use ATP molecules produced by their host cells. As we have probably discussed in, uh, in biochemistry, ATPs are molecules that are um, major energy storing or energy carrying molecules of cells. So, chlamydias use the ATP of, of their uh, host cell. Chlamydias are obligate intracellular pathogens that are transferred by inhalation of aerosols or by direct contact between hosts. And also take note that this is not transferred by arthropods. Medical, medically important chlamydias include chlamydia trachmatis, chlamydophilia pneumoniae, and chlamydophilia sitaki.
different serotypes of uh, chlamydia trachomatis cause different diseases including trachoma one of the leading causes of blindness in the world uh, another is inclusion conjunctivitis another type of eye disease and non-gonococcal urethritis now we'll give emphasis to the medically important acid fast bacteria which is uh, mycoplasmas Mycoplasmas are smallest of the cellular microbes. And because they lack cell walls, they assume many shapes from cocci to filamentous, thus they appear pleomorphic when examined microscopically. Sometimes they are confused with cell wall deficient forms of bacteria. However, when in the most favorable growth media, mycoplasmas are not able to produce cell walls which is not true for cell wall deficient bacteria. In humans, pathogenic mycoplasmas cause primary atypical pneumonia and genitourinary infections, and some species can grow intracellularly. And because they have no cell wall, they are resistant to treatment with penicillin and other antibiotics that work uh, by inhibiting cell wall synthesis. And that's why, uh, if you have noticed, when we are treating patients with uh, tuberculosis, we usually don't give, we always don't give uh, monotherapy or just one antibiotic. But usually the kind of antibiotic for TB, because they are very hard to treat, are triple and quadruple uh, kind of antibiotic in one tablet. Mycoplasmas can be cultured on artificial media in the laboratory where they produce tiny colonies. They are called the fried egg colonies because these resemble the sunny side up fried eggs in appearance. And note that the absence of a cell wall prevents the mycoplasmas from staining with the gram stain procedure. That's why it has a, a more specialized kind of uh, procedure in the form of the acid fast. This is the fried egg appearance of mycoplasma colonies on an agar medium. Now we'll move on to photosynthetic bacteria. Photosynthetic bacteria include purple bacteria, green bacteria, and cyanobacteria. This is erroneously referred to in the past as blue-green algae. And although all three groups use light as an energy source, they do not all carry out photosynthesis in the same way. For example, purple and green bacteria, which by the way in some cases are not really actually those colors, they do not produce oxygen whereas cyanobacteria do. And photosynthesis that produce oxygen is called oxygenic photosynthesis, whereas photosynthesis that does not produce oxygen is called Anoxygenic photosynthesis. Now we'll move on to the last topic, the domain Archaea. Archaea means ancient and the name Archaea was originally assigned when it was thought that these prokaryotes evolved earlier than bacteria. Genetically, even though they are prokaryotes, Archaea are more closely related to eukaryotes than they are to bacteria. Some possesses genes otherwise found only in eukaryotes. Many scientists believe that bacteria and archaea diverged from a common ancestor relatively soon after life began on this planet. Archaea vary widely in shape. Some are cocci, some are bacilli, and others form long filaments. Many archaea are extremophiles in the sense that they live in extreme environments such as extremely acidic, alkaline, hot, or cold, or salty environments, or environments where there is extreme high pressure. But of course, not all are extremophiles. Some live at the bottom of the ocean in or near the thermal vents, where an, in addition to heat and salinity, there is extreme pressure. Other archaea called methanogens produce methane, which is a flammable gas. And although virtually all archaea possess cell walls, their cell walls contain no peptidoglycan unlike in the bacterial cell wall that has it. 
So that ends our lecture. Thank you for listening.